Good afternoon. Welcome to a webinar on the visa process to bring foreign artists to your stages. I'm Penny Ojeda, Director of International Activities at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I'm here with Joel Nante, who is with the visa office of the State Department's Bureau of Consular Affairs. So here's what we'll do over the next hour. I'll offer some brief background and then turn it over to Joel for about a 20, 25 minute presentation, followed by time for questions. By the way, you're all muted right now and you will only be able to hear us. You can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint. Please don't use the raise your hand button for questions, the raised hand. Joel will do his best to address as many questions as possible during the time we have. This webinar will be posted on podcasts, webcasts, and webinars, the section of the NEA website uh, for archival material, and you'll find it there in a few days. Uh, you can refer to it in the future, and we'll hold a Twitter chat with Joel on June 25th. Over the last decade, the National Art Service organizations, such as the League of American Symphonies, Dance USA, Theater Communications Group, Opera America, and a few others have helped their fields navigate the process for temporary employment visas for foreign artists. They formed a visa working group to educate and assist arts organizations to comply with all aspects of the visa process successfully. The group developed a useful resource to assist the field, the website artistsfromabroad.org. The site was updated late in 2012 to, pr to improve its navigation. Arrows point to a few of the improvements, topic bars on the left, a search feature, the ability to print as a PDF. The website's currently being revised with new links to relevant sections of the Department of State and the Department and Homeland Security websites. You might want to book, bookmark artistsfromabroad.org along with the archive of this webinar and one that will be held on July 10th with Citizen Immigration Services as resources for when you undertake the visa process in the future. Today, our guest visa specialist, Joel Nante of the Department of State Bureau of Consular Affairs will give you an overview of the visa process and focus on the part that relates to the consular offices of U.S. embassies abroad. We hope this will help you prepare your artist to complete the visa application form, request an appointment, and go through the interview. Welcome, Joel. Thank you, Penny. Good afternoon, everyone. The Bureau of Consular Affairs assists U.S. citizens abroad facilitates legitimate travel, and deters the travel of persons seeking to engage in activities harmful to our country. Uh, we work every day to enhance national security while fostering legitimate travel to the U.S. We are working around the globe to strike the right balance between our dual goals of secure borders and open doors. We got plenty of ground to cover this day. Um, I do promise we're going to try to end the, the presentation early so we can have plenty of time to address your questions as well. Um, but some of the things we're going to talk about today is what exactly is a visa, um, the types of visas uh, that we'll particularly be discussing today and what we want to focus our discussion on are O visas and P visas, um, which I'm to understand are, are primarily the types of non-immigrant visas that uh, you're interested in bringing your performers and artists here to the U.S. on. We're going to cover uh, the basics of how to apply, what's needed to apply, and some of the best uh, tips and practices for applying. Uh, we're going to discuss visa issuance, uh, the, the process, the procedure, and we're also going to talk about denials. Finally, we're going to talk about the best way to contact the Department of State or any of our consulates or embassies if you have questions or concerns about the visa process. So what is a U.S. visa? Um, this is actually more complicated than most people think. Um, there's two distinct types of visas, non-immigrant visas and immigrant visas. Immigrant visas are those that bring people to the United States to become lawful permanent residents or to become U.S. citizens. But what we're going to focus on today is a non-immigrant visa. And a non-immigrant visa is a document, uh, usually placed in the bearer's passport, that allows them to travel to the U.S. port of entry. That would be any land border or airport. Um, 
and present themselves to DHS Customs and Border Protection um, to apply for admission to the United States. A visa by itself does not guarantee or allow a person to enter the United States. That final decision is made by DHS at the port of entry. Um, but the, the visa is an important part in the process um, that allows that individual to even board the flight or present themselves in front of DHS. So just a little bit of background about the work that we do overseas. Um, last year, fiscal year uh, 2012, we issued almost 9 million non-immigrant visas worldwide. Okay, We issue non-immigrant visas in a number of categories, uh, A through V, um, but like I said, we're going to focus on two O's and P's specifically today. You can find more information about different types of non-immigrant visas and how to apply for them on our website, which is travel.state.gov. So let's talk about the application process. Um, the first thing that we tell everyone, um, and this is good advice for you when you're, when you're helping your performers to apply, rule number one is to apply as early as possible. Um, as soon as you have uh, specifics and details about the performance, um, as soon as you have whatever pertinent petitions are required, approved, we encourage you to have your applicants uh, fill out the, the application online and make their appointment as early as possible. So what is required? First and foremost, for O or P visas, all require petitions uh, previously approved by the Department of State um, USCIS, which is the uh, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, all O and P's, um, regardless of any subcategories, uh, require a prior approved petition. So that's going to be the first step. Um, I also understand that uh, NEA is sponsoring a webinar with USCIS and they're going to be able to cover that process. Uh, very helpfully being told that's going to be on July 10th. Um, I'm sure they're going to have more information about that. So once the petition is approved, now it's time to actually think about the visa application. So the visa application is going to be a little bit different. Uh, this is going to happen overseas. Um, and every individual who is approved on the petition is going to need their own visa application. So what does that entail? It entails an online visa, visa application form, which is called a DS-160. Uh, this can be found through a number of places, uh, directly from travel.state.gov, um, but more importantly, the best way to go is through the, whatever particular embassy or consulate that you think your applicant will be applying from. Um, they'll be able to link directly to that, and I'll give you the website um, a little bit later, and they'll be able to follow the exact process and procedures for applying and having an interview at that embassy or consulate overseas. A couple of things they'll be required to have is a recent photograph. Um, our policy is to have a photograph that's been taken within at least the past six months. Uh, I know a lot of your performers and artists have uh, very beautiful headshots and other types of photographs. We actually do have some specific photograph requirements that they need to follow. Um, but just like a passport photo, these are easy to get uh, at any number of locations. They're required to have a passport as well. Uh, so make sure that your applicants uh, they have a passport, that their passport's not going to expire soon, um, that it's up to date, um, and that they, you know, if there's any name changes or anything like that, they're reflected. Uh, these are sometimes things people don't think about to the last minute, um, so it's, it's a good reminder right away to ask them about that. Let's talk about fees. There is going to be a fee for the visa application. This is per visa applicant, so again, every, even if a petition names uh, 10 uh, beneficiaries, each one of those individuals is going to have to pay the application fee. Um, currently, the fee right now uh, worldwide for a visa application for an O or P visa is 190 US dollars. Um, but we also encourage you to look at the websites um, for each individual specific country, okay? So the nationality of your applicant is going to determine whether or not there's any other required fees. We call these reciprocity fees. Um, and in, in layman's terms, the simple explanation is that U.S. immigration law requires us to charge uh, fees to applicants of a nationality if that same country would charge U.S. citizens the same fee. Um, so it's good to, again, when you're, when you're looking at everything, make sure you check those fees. And again, this is based on the applicant's nationality. Um, so if they're a German citizen, you would want to look and see if there's any applicable fees to German citizens for O's and P's. And that would be in addition to the 190 US dollar application fee. 
um, additional documentation as required. Um, for a lot of your applicants, uh, you know, the petition has already been approved. Um, that sometimes is the additional documentation. Um, but we also, again, based on whatever uh, consulate or U.S. Embassy they'll be applying to, we, we ask that you check their websites. Sometimes they have suggested uh, other documentation that's helpful for those individuals to bring to their interviews. Um, evidence of intent to return. Uh, some, some visas, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, require the applicant uh, to prove to the consular officer that they do, uh, have, they do not have immigrant intent. That is, uh, they, they've established a residence abroad which they intend to return to after their temporary stay in the United States. And like I said, we'll, we'll return to that a little bit later. For more in-depth information and to actually access uh, the, the specific websites of our U.S. embassies and consulates abroad, we refer you to usembassy.gov. Okay, you can actually also access that site very easily from travel.state.gov uh, and this will easily bring you to whichever embassy or, or consulate website that you want to view the specific requirements for. So as I suggested there's for O's and P's there's some additional documentation that may be helpful uh, and I'm really going to get into the process and explain a little bit of the back and forth that we have with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so like I said they ultimately are, are adjudicating the petition um, and once the petition is approved then the individuals can apply for their O or P visa. Um, at that time what happens um, and I know this is a question for a lot of individuals is once the USCIS approves a petition they send a copy of that approved petition to um, our consular facility in Kentucky actually um, and we make that electronically available for our consular officers worldwide um, so that's why you know in the past individuals if you've been doing this for a while used to indicate on the um, petition where that individual would actually be applying and, and um, a long time ago we used to mail those uh, those approved petitions all over the world we no longer do that we make them electronically available and that's why uh, you don't no longer really need to indicate where they're going to apply because we're going to have that and we will be able to access that information uh, wherever they apply throughout the world however one thing that USCIS will remind you of and will remind you of is that when you're submitting your petition applications to USCIS um, they require that you submit a copy so the original and a copy um, and this is specifically important as well for any request for evidence that they send you for uh, during the petition adjudication process. Uh, the reason being is that if you do not send a copy, um, if the petitioner does not send a copy to USCIS, then USCIS does not have a copy to send to the Department of State. So oftentimes while we can electronically verify that the petition has been approved, uh, if we need to see any information that's in that petition in order to adjudicate the visa application, uh, we're going to ask your applicant uh, if they can provide us a copy. So again, it's a best practice. It's not usually required, um, but give your applicant a copy of the petition that was filed for them, including any copies of requests for evidence that were sent to USCIS. If we need them, um, then it's, it's much easier than we don't have to go back and forth with the applicant. Um, if they have them at the visa interview, it'll save a lot of time if they're needed. Uh, including uh, with that, any scheduled performances or events that's covered under the approved petition. Um, specifically also if there's any additional events um, that they're eligible that have been added later on after the petition's been approved, it's really good when they can bring that in. Um, in addition to that, any documentation is going to be case by case, but if they have anything that um, they think would, would help show their experience, um, their past history, um, as a performer or even as a traveler, sometimes they can bring that in. In most cases we won't ask for it, but again it's always better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So what does the consular officer consider? So as many of you know, um, the application for a visa is not just the online application form, but it also includes an interview. Um, for a number of reasons, we ask every, uh, almost every uh, visa applicant to come in and specifically speak to a consular officer. And what they're doing, first and foremost, we're doing that because we're required to take fingerprints, uh, required to make sure we match up uh, photographs and, and make sure that the individual applying for the visa is the individual that was listed on the petition, as well as prove identity. Um, but what else are we what else are we looking for? What else does a consular officer consider? Um, first and foremost, we, we consider that applicant's qualifications under the law. So U.S. immigration law specifically uh, denotes different qualifications for O's and P visas, and we consider those. Um, we consider each case on its own merits. So even though there may be a petition that lists 
50 or 100 beneficiaries, we're going to consider each visa case on its own merits. Okay. Uh, in cases that they're required legally, we have to uh, we have to consider presumption of an immigrant intent, and this can be confusing. Um, but basically, U.S. immigration law um, says that consular officers have to basically presume that every applicant for a non-immigrant visa actually um, does intend to come to the United States uh, and immigrate permanently. Um, and it, part of the interview and part of the process is basically to allow the consular officer um, and the visa applicant to interact uh, and the visa applicant to convince the consular officer that they actually intend to only stay temporarily for the purposes of the visa. Okay, so we consider a number of things under that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but it's important that even in these cases where the petition's already been approved, this is still one of the factors that never got considered um, by DHS or USCIS when they adjudicated the petition that the consular officer is required to consider. Uh, consular officers also live overseas and, and meet the applicants um, because it helps us review anything um, that may have fraud concerns. Uh, again, this doesn't apply to 99% of applicants, uh, but unfortunately there's a small percentage of individuals overseas that do want to fraudulently present themselves um, to consular officers and, and try to come to the United States for uh, ill intent. So the, the other part of this is that we want to make sure that these individuals are who they say they are and they're not misrepresenting themselves or their qualifications um, and that they, again, qualify under the law. We also ensure that the applicant has no other ineligibilities um, that would may require a waiver. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later on when we talk about uh, visa refusals. Um, but this is just a snapshot of why we, we have these interviews with visa applicants. So how do we decide? Okay. So consular officers, first and foremost, are finders of facts. So we have knowledge um, and local knowledge, and this is again why consular officers are, are around the world. Um, we have knowledge uh, about the places we're living, about the applicants and where they're coming from. Um, we have knowledge from host government officials and authority. Um, and then we get information both from the approved petition and we gather information from the applicants in front of us. So based on all that information, we decide whether or not they're eligible for the visa, and usually they are, and we can issue the visa, um, or if we find information that shows that they're not eligible for the visa, we're required to refuse that visa. Okay, so first and foremost, let's talk about types of visa denials. So when we deny a visa. So there's, there's reasons we would deny immigrant visas, um, but what we want to focus on are non-immigrant visas. Okay, so we have what we call category one refusals. Okay. When, when we have national security concerns, when there's criminal ineligibilities or contagious diseases, U.S. law requires us to refuse visas to those individuals so they cannot travel to the United States because they would pose a threat to the United States and our citizens. These are serious, serious refusals. We also have Category 2 refusals, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail because these are, these are less straightforward than the Category 1 refusals. So Category 2 refusals, um, can typically be be overcome later on through either more information or a, a subsequent interview. They're not necessarily uh, permanent inadmissibilities to the United States. So the most common, like we talked about before, is what we call INA 214B. Okay, This is a section of U.S. immigration law that basically says um, that we have to ensure that most uh, non-immigrants do not actually intend to immigrate to the United States. So. With P's and O's, I know it can be a little confusing. Um, O1s are not required by immigration law to have a residence abroad, which they don't intend of abandoning. Okay, um, other O's, O2s, O3s, and all P's are required to show to a consular officer that they have a residence abroad that they don't intend to abandon, and that's part of immigrant intent. Um, you know, do they have sufficient ties to the home country um, or to a third country where they've resettled and maybe have residence at, a, at another location? Um, for O1s, like I said, the U.S. immigration law specifically says they do not need to have a residence abroad. Um, but we also have to be certain that even O1s intend to only come to the United States and, and stay temporarily. Otherwise, they can re be refused under INA Section 214B. There's another denial, which is what we call 221G, and that also is a section of U.S. immigration law. 
A lot of times what this means is simply that the, the consular officer has insufficient information to establish a visa eligibility. This is a very common refusal and we use it for a number of reasons. Sometimes if we have additional questions we need answered, we need additional information, um, we we have to refuse a, an application 221G um, and in that situation we're going to give the applicant uh, written notification of what it, other information they need to present to us. Um, sometimes we also use this when we have uh, additional administrative processing that we need to conduct um, before we can actually issue a visa. So we're required to always make a decision. We can't just say we'll, we'll decide later. We either have to approve or deny. Um, so sometimes we use that 221G denial um, to deny just because we're waiting for additional documentation or we just have to do some administrative processing on the case before it can be approved. If a visa is refused 214B, uh, the only mechanism to overcome that refusal is to make a new application. So it would be a new separate application um, and a new interview um, in order to overcome that. 221G refusals uh, often, like I said, we use them for administrative processing, additional information. Oftentimes those can be overcome by the alien um, applicant submitting whatever additional documentation it is or for us ourselves just to finish whatever other administrative process we had to do before we can issue the case. We're required and we all always do uh, inform the applicant of the decision um, both orally at the interview and in writing. Um, we'll also try to explain um, a lot of times we'll have uh, information printed out that we'll hand to the applicant it, explaining both the section of law that they were refused under as well as the reason for our decision. Um, but I do want to say that adjudications are subject to review by supervisory officers at post. Um, there is no visa denial appeal process. Okay, Consular officers have sole authority to make these decisions under the law. So there is no ability for anyone to appeal the, the decision that was made by the consular officer. Um, here in Washington, D.C., we have an office that can review uh, advisory opinions, uh, legal in nature, and we'll, we'll give you that information later on if you are an attorney uh, representing applicants. Um, but again, that's regarding the interpretation of the law. We cannot review the, the facts that were found by the consular officer, just how the consular officer actually applied U.S. law. So what is the best way to contact the consulate? Um, again, using our website, either travel.state.gov or more directly, uh, usembassy.gov. Uh, every embassy or consulate around the world is going to have unique contact information. Um, a lot of times we'll have directly uh, information to an email address uh, posted for, again, it would be the non-immigrant visa unit. Um, sometimes we go through uh, third-party contractors uh, that do a lot of our call centers for our larger posts overseas. So sometimes you might be directed towards them. Um, or uh, you will have an online submission through the embassy or consulate website where you can submit questions directly. Um, some tips and tricks is that you always want to include uh, the applicant case number, uh, the applicant's uh, name, date of birth uh, with your inquiries so that they can be referenced easily. Additionally, um, passport information, country, city of birth is also helpful. Um, and we do ask that you send emails. We do get a number of letters, but again, it takes letters uh, a lot longer uh, based on our, our mailroom processes as well as security processes to get those letters to somebody so they can be answered. Email really is the most efficient and effective way um, to contact a U.S. Embassy or consulate about a case. You can also contact here in the United States in the visa office here in Washington, D.C. We have a public inquiries division um, within the Bureau of Consular Affairs. And you can find their information. Um, the public inquiries number is 202-663-1225. Okay. They fielded over 800,000 phone calls last year from individuals overseas and here in the United States. Um, and that's just our U.S office. Um, that does not include all the inquiries we had from our embassies and consulates that were fielded. If you are an attorney of record uh, representing a visa applicant, you can also email any legal questions to legalnet at state.gov. Um, you will have to provide a copy of the signed G28, the visa case number, um, when asking your question there. We will, that email address is, is again only for attorneys of record uh, with a signed G28 on file. Um, please send that with your inquiry. 
again, our website is travel.state.gov. Um, you can find a U.S. Embassy on, the, on our website um, or go directly to usembassy.gov. Um, now, I think we have about 30 minutes left over, and we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, I do want to preface that what I, a couple of things I, I can't discuss and I'll defer is any questions about the petition process. Um, that's really the sole domain of Department of Homeland Security and USCIS. And like I said, I believe they're going to have a webinar as well with the NEA. So you can direct those questions to them. Also, what I'd like to stay away from is any case-specific questions. Um, not really the right forum to, to discuss. Uh, please use our contact information if you actually have case-specific um, questions, but happy to take any procedural policy general questions uh, about the visa application process. Okay, great. Uh, I believe our first question is, what is the total cost of applying for an NIV? Um, and right now, if we're talking about an O&P visa, uh, the total cost right now is 190 US dollars. But again, that also is going to not include any additional reciprocity fees um, that might be required uh, based on the applicant's nationality. So again, we ask that you go to your webs the websites we have, and you'll be able to identify those right away um, and plan ahead uh, for any of those additional reciprocity fees. We have a question, a good question from Tamara. Uh, it's been recommended to me that we mail the original petition approval. Um, we don't need the original petition approval. Um, again, this is one of those re those recommended uh, documents. It's far from required as we will actually verify electronically the approval of the petition. So we don't need the original petition approval notice. Um, you know, if you scan or email a copy to the artist themselves, that's that's more than sufficient. Kevin asks a question about the fees for US, uh, USCIS petition. Like I said, they're, that's a, it's a different topic, and they'll be able to address those during their webinar. Um, or you can find that, I'm sure, on their website. Typical processing time for visas. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, again, it's going to depend post by post. And because every case is unique, um, it's hard to say you know, what your applicant is going to see. Um, but typically, most of our uh, consulates and embassies abroad have interview appointments available within one to two weeks. Um, so it's really just a matter of once that petition is approved and they make their visa application, then they can actually go on to schedule an appointment. Um, but from that time, again, one to two weeks is, is typical for most posts around the world. Some posts are, are exceptions to that. Um, but from that time, uh, a majority of individuals are able to actually go to their interview, um, be approved, and receive their visa then, um, depending on, on how they get the pass back from that consulate or embassy uh, within, a, within a week. Um, so it's not, typical, it's not atypical um, to be able to schedule an interview within one or two weeks and then receive the actual approved visa in their passport within another week. Kathy um, asks a question about uh, the questions on the DS-160. Um, yes, if you go online, you can, uh, to our website, you can actually print off uh, a copy of the form. Even though you can't apply, uh, we do have electronic copies that are available. So without going on um, and actually filling it out for the artist, um, or if you choose, you can always go on there and fill it out. Um, you just don't have to submit the form, and you haven't actually paid and made an application yet. Um, but you do. there is a link on the uh, process to be able to print out a paper copy uh, so that you have access to all the questions that are, are asked of the applicants. Yeah. <laughs> 
Hamena asks a question, and, and Hamena, maybe you can you can clarify what you're asking. There are two processing times, one for the application and another at the consulate. Um, if, if by application you mean the visa application, typically once you've filled that out and submitted it online, it's available to us um, instantaneously. So uh, typically most consulates or embassies, once you fill out that application form, you can then with that uh, confirmation code go on directly to make the interview appointment at the consulate. So yeah, so um, if you're if you're referencing again the petition, that's a that's a different time frame. But the visa process really kind of starts once the petition's been approved. Kim Lusk asks a very very uh, detailed question. I'll, I'll try to address it. Um, as I can. So the difference between O and P visas are are based on U.S. immigration law, and U.S. immigration law sets different specific uh, requirements for each individual uh, visa. So an O visa um, is a non-immigrant visa for aliens who have extraordinary ability in the sciences, arts, or education, um, as well as uh, support personnel who are crucial to that aliens, performance, uh, science, art, um, these can be in business, athletics, um, and usually are, by, are demonstrated by sustained national or international acclaim. Um, additionally, it's, it's available to those who uh, are, let me read the, the actual terminology. Or is an alien who has, who has a demonstrated record of extraordinary achievement in motion picture and or television productions. Okay, um, and then that would be an O1 individual, and then an O2 category is actually individuals who are directly uh, crucial to supporting the O1's uh, activities. Additionally, there's an O3 category, which is um, available for spouses and children of O1s or O2s, so they can sometimes bring their, their spouse and children with them on these non-immigrant visas. Um, P petitions are a little bit more broad. There's, there's a lot more uh, classifications available. Um, let me just reference the law real quick so I don't, I don't misspeak, but the P non-immigrant non visa classification is available for a number of, of different types of individuals. So a P1 Okay, is authorized for an alien to perform as an athlete, um, either individually as part of the group, at an internationally recognized level of performance. Okay, um, additionally, it can be available for their essential support personnel. This would be individuals that are essential to support the performance or um, uh, uh, the performance of the P1. Okay, additionally, this is a P2 is for a classification applies to artists or entertainers, um, either individuals or groups, that are or their essential support personnel who will be performing under a, re uh, a reciprocal exchange program. Um, these, these are a little bit more rare and usually um, come down through different types of art exchanges between our, our government and other governments. And finally, P3s are for culturally unique programs. Uh, these are for artists or entertainers individually again or as a group and their essential support personnel who wish to come to the United States for the purpose of developing, interpreting, representing, coaching or teaching a unique or traditional ethnic, folk, cultural, musical, uh, theatrical or artist, artistic performance or presentation. Um, so again, there's, there's a lot of subtle difference to these. Um, I do recommend that when you're, when you're considering all these, um, some individuals uh, like to retain immigration counsel. Um, but again, the, the qualifications are set by U.S. law. Uh, when you're applying for the petition for these, there's uh, different criteria that USCIS will look at. There's different levels of evidence that they'll they'll look at, um, and similarly for the visa application. Tamara uh, asks a great question about what 
what do you recommend applicants bring to the interview to prove intent to return to their home country? Um, and this is a really difficult question. Uh, a lot of times consular officers don't need to see anything. A lot of times the consular officer, nine times out of ten, a consular officer is going to be able to determine this uh, through their knowledge of uh, the host country that they're living and working in, um, as well as the interview process itself, getting to know the applicant, asking questions about them. Um, this is something that we can determine typically without documentation. Things they may want to show um, are any of, you know, do they have proof of their job that they have in the United States, or not in the United States, I'm sorry, they're in their home country that they're coming back to? Um, do they own property? We don't necessarily need to see proof of the property, um, but there's things we're going to look at. You know, do they have, you know, family members um, in the host country? Things like that. Those are the types of questions and, and sometimes individuals can bring that. Uh, again, I would defer to the specific U.S. Embassy or consulate website on, on what's recommended for applicants to bring in that country. Um, and that actually goes to another point is if applicants are applying outside of a country that they typically live in, which is 100% permissible, um, they might want to reference um, the, the website of the country they're actually applying in, which is maybe a little bit different than the website of the country that they're from. Next question is who petitions and who applies for the NIV? Uh, who petitions is going to be either a US-based um, uh, employer or an agent, uh, somebody uh, acting as an agent. Um, typically, visa applicants in O&P categories cannot self-petition, um, but would require a U.S.-based employer or a foreign employer um, or a U.S.-based agent to apply uh, the, for the petition for them. Um, as far as the application for the NIV, this is, again, specific to the alien themselves. So a lot of times um, the applicant is going to be the, the uh, alien performer themselves. It can be filled out by others and there's a place to indicate that this the uh, visa application is being filled out on behalf of them for, by somebody else, um, but typically this is will be applied for by most applicants themselves, whereas the petition has to be filed by somebody other than the applicant for an O or P visa. Uh, Jimena, you ask, uh, what is the petition time frame? Unfortunately, it's something I'm going to have to defer to USCIS, as that's, um, that's their purview, and, and they'll be able to speak more to that. But I do believe on their website they, they have general information about the petition processing time frames. Tamara asks another good question. Can an applicant bring a translator to the interview? Um, nine times out of ten, this is it's not needed, um, and sometimes, therefore, it's not permissible. Uh, oftentimes, consular officers, U.S. consular officers serving in a country are going to have uh, the languages of that specific country. Otherwise, we're going to have our own interpreters uh, to help us conduct those interviews. Um, so most of the time, it's not, it's not permitted. And because we do see a number of applicants every day through our consulates, we try to keep it as, as less crowded as we can. So oftentimes, um, extra individuals are not permitted to attend an interview with someone. Um, in the rare circumstances where maybe the individual is applying outside of um, their home country, they don't have local uh, local uh, language at the country they're in, there may be um, unique situations where they actually um, can reach out. But again, that's a time when you want to want to contact the U.S. Embassy or consulate and ask that question um, just to make sure if your applicant only speaks a certain language that we have the ability to interview that individual in that language. Kevin asks a question. Uh, there is some confusion in terms of the types of questions that consular officers uh, can ask of artists during their interviews. Uh, can you talk about this? Um, Kevin, without any further information, I believe what you're discussing is the, the policy of asking entertainers to perform in, in, during the interview. Um, so I'll talk about that. It, it is a, a policy of the Department of State um, that consular officers do not ask for a, the applicants to perform in the waiting room or during the interview at all. Um, you know, oftentimes this is not needed and, and we can evaluate their qualifications for the, the specific visas without any performances. So it is, it has been a policy of ours um, that we tell consular officers 
um, that they should not be asking applicants to perform uh, during their interviews. Kathy asks another great question. Do all members of a company have to appear at the consulate office at the same time, or can they go a few at a time? Uh, I will say that there's no requirement that they all appear at the same time. I will say that sometimes actually this is actually very beneficial, both to the consular officers as well as to all the applicants themselves. Um, a lot of times if there's a big group, you can reach out to the U.S. consulate or embassy ahead of time, give them a heads up, and they'll actually be able to set aside time slots for everybody to come at once. Um, it's really beneficial to us because we know a big group is coming. Uh, we know all these members are coming together. Um, and oftentimes we can get through the applications a lot quicker um, and smoother. However, that's not a requirement. Um, applicants, again, are going to make their own interviews um, based on their own uh, availability. Uh, and they can even apply at different consulates or embassies around the world if they're not all in the same location. So again, we have electronic access to the approval of the petitions. Um, and once we have that, applicants can actually apply at any US embassy or consulate around the world, whatever is most convenient to them. Okay, and so we have a question about, um, can I extend a visa once I'm in the U.S.? Um, so again, a little bit of a difference between a visa and um, being admitted to the U.S. is a visa, again, is, is given and it's the permission for that individual, that alien, to travel to the United States and present themselves for entry. Um, and actually entry and in the, in their, their time of entry is actually determined by uh, DHS at the border. So while a visa might be valid for, let's say, a year, um, they get to the border and DHS says, based on your petition approval, um, we're actually going to admit you for a year and a half. So sometimes those times can be different. So it's one thing that it's confusing, but it, it's important to keep in mind. So the question about extending a visa once you're in the U.S., you cannot necessarily extend your visa once you're in the U.S. But if you're admitted into the U.S. by DHS um, in O-1 status, um, they're going to give you a time frame, and it's typically based on the approved petition for you. Um, and say your employer or your agent files an amended petition to extend or, or a new petition that is going to be concurrent with your current petition, you can actually apply with DHS to extend your, your stay in the United States. Um, this is not the same process as a visa process. You won't actually get a new visa in your passport, but what you'll receive if it's approved is permission from DHS um, about your time in the U.S., your length of stay is what it's called. Um, and this absolutely can be uh, applied for while you're in the U.S. Uh, I will caution, though, is if you're a if you're, uh, performer, if your applicant needs to travel back and forth from the United States to other places, it may actually be beneficial for them once that subsequent petition is approved to actually apply for a new visa that covers that time frame as well. Um, and that way, they won't be in a situation where they don't have a visa, which is required to actually travel to the United States. Um, and the their previous visa will have expired. We have another question about refusals. Um, this would be for an alien. Uh, if your applicant was refused a visa under Section 214B, uh, I believe we talked earlier about how the only way to overcome that refusal really is with a new visa application. Um, now, if the applicant's been refused under Section 214B um, and the petition's still valid, they can make a new visa application under that already approved petition. Um, unless you know, it's a different situation when information is sent back to USCIS and USCIS actually uh, revokes the already approved petition. Um, but as long as the petition is still valid, the applicant can make another application for a visa under that already approved petition. However, we do caution that if an applicant's uh, situation hasn't 
changed very much uh, since their prior refusal. Um, is that there's not new information to be shared. Um, it's it's unlikely that they're going to receive a different decision than they received before. However, um, if they have new information to share with that visa application, or if there's there's different information um, that they can bring, it, there may be there may be a reason to apply for a new visa under that same petition. How much lead time would you recommend before uh, a performance to apply for an artist visa? Again, I, I think I've said it on, on my second slide, and I'll say it again, and, and we'll always say it. Uh, we do recommend that you apply as early as possible. Um, what that means is that as soon as the petition is approved, um, we do recommend that you apply. Consular officers can consider an application and actually issue a visa 90 days before the, the start date of that petition. Um, we will tell your applicants and they'll be informed uh, in writing that even though we're issuing it 90 days before the actual petition's uh, valid, um, they won't be allowed to enter the United States until 10 days before that petition's valid. But we are still able to issue up to 90 days, which means they have their visa in hand um, with plenty of time, three months, before they actually have to come to the U.S. and begin their, their performance or whatever um, their reason for coming to the United States is. So again, as early as possible. Courtney asks a, a question, um, and we're going to defer a little bit on this to DHS and, and USCIS for their webinar, but the difference between a petition and a visa application, a petition is what's filed by the employer um, or the agent, and it's filed with uh, Department of Homeland Security, and they really say, based on the qualifications under the law and the documentation being submitted, whether or not um, the, the position fits uh, U.S. immigration law. The visa application is then made by the applicant, uh, where the consular officers determine whether or not that individual is admissible to the United States or whether they have any eligibilities uh, and whether or not they actually possess the requirements uh, specified in the petition. Kevin, a great question. Um, the website where people can track uh, visa wait times at all of our U.S. embassies and consulates abroad. Uh, you can find it from travel.state.gov. Um, you can look individually on the U.S. embassies or consulates websites at usembassy.gov. Um, but when you go to travel.state.gov, if you click on the upper hand uh, visa page, you're going to find a wealth of information about both non-immigrant visas and, and immigrant visas. And you're going to be uh, able to view all the current wait times. Uh, we update these weekly. Um, that individuals will have to wait for an interview. So, you know, if the wait time's three days and I'm going today, I know that within three days I'll be able to find an open uh, appointment for a visa interview. I have uh, another two questions that are, are kind of the same question, so I'll, I'll handle them both together. The first question is, um, I saw a reference to a visa application center. What are they? And the second question is, if you are fingerprinted at the, or, I'm sorry, are you fingerprinted at the time of the interview, or is that a separate appointment, um, which could possibly mean a separate trip? So, again, this is going to be based on the specific U.S. embassy or U.S. consulate where your applicant is applying. And again, this is why, throughout my presentation, I've recommended you go to those websites and, and follow the exact procedures um, designated for that specific embassy or web or consulate. Um, but I will say that we have different procedures around the world. And some of our uh, procedures are, especially some of our very large processing places, is that we, we contract some of the work that's done, such as the call centers and, and taking of fingerprints and other things like that. Um, in those locations, oftentimes you will have to actually make two separate appointments, one for the taking of the fingerprints, turning in application, um, paperwork and a separate one for actually having your interview in front of the consular officer. So those can be again either the same day appointment, part of the same appointment, or they could be two separate appointments. Um, and a lot of times, if they're two separate appointments, you're not going to be able to do those on the same day. So you can you can typically do them back to back. Um, a lot of times, we'll offer um, Sunday and Saturday services for fingerprinting in a, in a certain city, um, and then they'll be able to schedule their interview on Monday or Tuesday. So they'll you know hopefully. Uh, compact the travel to that city if they're if they're traveling there specifically to make their application for the visa. Um, but again, we do recommend 
um, as early as you can when they know where they'll be actually applying, direct them to the, the website so they can find out the specific uh, criteria for making their application there. Um, Adam, your, your question I'm not actually able to address. Um, that's kind of very specific to um, one individual, so this is not the proper form, but we do recommend um, that you reach out to the specific uh, embassy or consulate uh, with that specific question. Um, thank you very much. Got another question about uh, lawyers contacting LegalNet at state.gov. Uh, how quickly can they receive a response? Um, I believe our individuals uh, fielding those questions strive to get responses within two to three days, um, although sometimes it can be a little bit longer depending on the situation, um, depending on staffing, depending on volume that we have, um, and depending on whether or not we have to research the case. But typically within a week, um, we I believe we answer about 90% of those questions. Again. To ensure that it gets answered quickly, we we do um, we we must have you send your signed G28 with the question, as well as um, the applicant's name, date of birth, um, the case number if you have it, um, petition number, and the more details you have when you send that, the easier it is for us to locate the case um, to answer the specific question. Tanya asks if a visa is denied for any reason, are there any additional fees either for reapplication or otherwise? Uh, Tanya, if, if the reason for the denial is a final refusal and, and not a refusal for more information that we can overcome later on, um, and the only way to overcome that refusal is to make a new application, yes, the every application that requires a new fee, um, and that's because the U.S. law requires that we charge fees per actual decision. Um, and not just uh, for that individual. Um, so every time a new application for a visa is made, it does require uh, a new fee to be made. I think we're winding up. There aren't any more questions coming in. This is Penny Ojeda, Director of International Activities at the NEA again and I want to thank Joel for sharing this valuable information and generously taking so many questions and I want to remind everyone that this webinar will be archived this Friday June 21st on the NEA website for your future reference and that the Twitter chat is scheduled with Joel on this topic for June 25th so if you have other questions that come up in the meantime join us for the Twitter chat and share this uh, the hashtag with your friends also I want to remind you that that uh, we'll be hosting a second webinar. Uh, Joel referenced repeatedly that the visa is a multi-part process. The first part is with the Department of Homeland Security, Citizen and Immigration Services, and we will have a content specialist for a webinar on July 12th to cover the July 10th, sorry, July 10th, to cover the petition process, and uh, that will be a chance to speak more about the different classifications of O and P and help you figure out which is best for your artist. And this is um, where you have a larger role because the U.S. presenter is very often the petitioner for the artist coming uh, for performances here. So again, that webinar is July 10th. Uh, we'll be sending a notice out and I uh, hope that you'll join us for that, and that one will also have a Twitter chat scheduled, and the Twitter chat's uh, July 15. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, and we hope to see you back on July 10th, and spread the word to your friends. Bye.